President. You know, Bismarck famously talked about legislation being like making sausages. And there are aspects of both that are not pretty. I wish we saw elected leaders in both parties working together to listen to the American people. You know, the majority leader talked about the meeting at the White House. And I will note, he noted that I was not at that meeting. I would, that is certainly true. But the statement that the president said he would not negotiate came directly from Speaker Boehner, who was at that meeting, who came and gave a press conference immediately thereafter. And I know the majority leader is not impugning the integrity of the Speaker of the House or disputing that that is exactly what President Obama said and what the position of the Democrats has said. Their position is, give us 100% of what we want or the government stays shut down. And Mr. President, that quite simply is not reasonable. Now, I'd like to address for a moment a few of the arguments that have been raised against these very reasonable bipartisan proposals to fund essential priorities in our government, because I think the arguments don't withstand scrutiny. There are some on the Democratic side of the aisle that have said, we're not going to pick and choose. Indeed, the majority leader said there's no reason to have to choose between government priorities. Mr. President, let me suggest that's the essence of legislation. We have a $17 trillion debt because far too many people have said, as the majority leader just did, there's no reason to choose between priorities. We should spend on everything. And I would note also that what the Democrats in this chamber deride as a piecemeal strategy is the traditional means of appropriating and legislating. The only reason that, that we have this omnibus continuing resolution is because Congress has failed to do its job to appropriate on specific subject matters. So we should be considering the VA on its own merits. And I would note the majority leader is right that the House bill funded the most critical components of the VA, pension and, and, and home loan and GI bill and disability payments. But I would readily accede to the majority leader that if he would like a continuing resolution that funds the entirety of the VA, including the elements he laid out, I think we could receive, reach unanimous agreement on that within hours. The traditional means of legislating is one subject at a time. It is not typical when considering funding for the VA that the argument be about unrelated matters whether it is the Department of Agriculture or Obamacare. The way this body has always operated is it's considered one subject matter at a time, except when Congress has failed to appropriate and then everything has gotten lumped together in a giant omnibus bill. But there's no reason for that. But secondly, Mr. President, every bit as critically, we've done it already. This is not theoretical. At the beginning of this proceeding, the House of Representatives unanimously passed a bill saying, let's fund the men and women of our military. Now, when it came over to the Senate, a great many people expected the majority leader to do what the majority leader just did, to object to funding the men and women of our military. And indeed, some 20 Republican senators came down to the floor prepared to make the argument that we shouldn't hold the men and women of the military hostage. And yet, much to our very pleasant surprise, the majority leader reconsidered. He decided that it was, one must assume, not defensible to hold hostage the paychecks of the men and women of the military. And so the majority leader concluded, agreed, and this body unanimously passed funding for the men and women of the military. He said, look, regardless of what happens with, with a, a government shutdown, our soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines should not be held hostage. They should get their paychecks. And indeed, I rose on the Senate floor. I commended the majority leader for doing the right thing, for acting in a bipartisan manner. And yet, sadly, that was the last of that behavior we were to see. I hope that majority leader returns. I hope the majority leader who said, we're going to fund the men and women of our military, returns to say the same thing to our veterans. I hope that majority leader returns to say the same things to our National Guard. I hope that majority leader says, returns to say the same thing to our parks and war memorials. I hope that majority leader returns to say the same thing to the National Institutes for Health, to say the same thing to children facing life-threatening diseases like cancer. You know, we may not be able to resolve 100% of this impasse today.
There are differences, and to resolve those differences is going to take sitting down, talking, working through the, the matters of disagreement. One side of this chamber is prepared to do this. The Democrats are not. In the meantime, it ought to be a bipartisan priority to fund our veterans. You know, a second possible objection, I can see some watching this debate who think, well, okay, but if you, if you fund the VA, doesn't that mean the Democrats have given in on Obamacare? Somehow it's got to be collected, connected to Obamacare, right? Mr. President, as every member of this body knows, the VA is totally disconnected. The VA bill that passed the House, it doesn't implicate Obamacare, it doesn't mention Obamacare, it does nothing on Obamacare. Look, we've got a disagreement on Obamacare. Part of this body thinks it's a terrific bill. Part of this body thinks it's a train wreck, a disaster that's hurting millions of Americans. That's an important debate. But whether or not our veterans get their disability payments shouldn't be made hostage to resolving that debate. It is exactly like the bill that my friends on the Democratic side of the aisle already voted for to fund the men and women of the military. It's exactly the same. They've done it once, and yet for whatever reason, they have made a decision that certainly appears to the public to be cynical and partisan. There should be no confusion. The House of Representatives has overwhelmingly voted to protect our veterans and fund the VA. 35 Democrats joined Republicans in the House to do that. 35, it was bipartisan legislation. It came over here, every Senate Republicans agrees we should fund the VA, we should pass this bill. There is unanimity, and indeed the President, when he addressed the nation, said his priority was to fund the VA. So we've got Republicans and Democrats in the House agreeing we should fund the VA. We have Republicans in the Senate and a Democratic President of the United States agreeing we should fund the VA. And sadly, we have Democrats in the Senate and a majority leader in the Senate objecting and stopping the VA from being funded. If my friends on the Democratic side of the aisle simply stood up right now and withdrew their objection, by the end of the day, the VA would receive its funding. If my friends on the Democratic side of the aisle simply stood up and withdrew their objection, by the end of the day, our friends in the reserve would receive their paychecks or be eligible, would, would have the paychecks and the funding returned. If my friends on the Democratic side of the aisle withdrew their objection, by the end of the day, our national parks and memorial would have their funding and we'd be able to open the Statue of Liberty, open our, our war memorials. And by the end of the day, we could restore the funding to the National Institutes of Health. And let me note, there are many other priorities. I, my, my friend from Maryland, when he was talking about other priorities, look, there are a great many aspects of government. For example, earlier this week, the Director of National Intelligence and the head of the NSA testified in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And the head of National Intelligence said that some 70% of civilian employees in the intelligence community have been furloughed and that that presents a real threat to our national security. Mr. President, if that's right, where is the Commander-in-Chief? Why is the President of the United States not down here right now saying, look, regardless of what y'all do in the rest of the budget, don't expose us to national security threats. Let's fully fund the Department of Defense. Let's fully fund our intelligence agency. And indeed, I would note that one senator, the junior senator from Arizona, asked the head of national intelligence, have you advised the president that Congress should pass a continuing resolution funding the intelligence community just like we did for the members of the armed forces? And the answer from the head of the national intelligence appointed by President Obama was, yes, Congress should do it, and yes, I will advise the president. Mr. President, right now we have Senate Democrats who are not listening to the testimony and advice of the members of our intelligence community who say that there is a grave national security threat that we are not adequately prepared to defend ourselves against. Surely partisan politics should end at that point. Surely we should be able to come together and say, look, 
We can keep fighting on Obamacare. We may have disagreements, and eventually we'll work it out. But we, surely we shouldn't expose our national security to threats from terrorists or attacks on our homeland in the meantime. That ought to be 100 to 0, Mr. President. But at the end of the day, there's only one explanation that makes sense for why you saw one Democrat after another standing up and objecting, no, don't fund the VA, no, don't fund the reserve members of our military, no, don't fund the parks, no, don't fund the memorials, no, don't fund the, the National Institutes of Health. The only explanation which is at all plausible is that many members of this body agree with some of the pundits that this shutdown benefits the political fortunes of Democrats. You know, I sure hope people are focused on things other than political fortunes and partisan politics, because I know every one of us takes seriously the obligation we have to our constituents back home. I sure hope that's not going on, but you know, it's hard for the American people not to be cynical when they read about Mount Vernon, which is privately owned and operated, doesn't get its money from the federal government, being effectively forced to shut down because the federal government blocked the parking lots and put up barricades to prevent people from going to Mount Vernon. It's hard not to be cynical when you read about what my friend Senator John Thune told me about Mount Rushmore, that the federal government erected barricades on the roads leaving Mount Rushmore. Spent the money to do it, mind you. There's a shutdown. They spent the money to erect the barricades. Problem is, those aren't federal roads. Those are state roads, and the governor said, take them down. The only conclusion that's possible there is that you're seeing cynical partisan gamesmanship, a decision by President Obama and unfortunately by Democrats in this body that inflicting the maximum pain on the American people will yield political benefits. We ought to be able to agree our veterans are above politics. We ought to be able to agree our war memorials are above politics. We ought to be able to come together and agree that defending national security, defending against terrorist threats, is above politics. And everyone in Congress is prepared to do so, except for the majority leader in the Senate Democrats who are insisting everything be shut down. So, Mr. President, if a federal government worker is at home today furloughed, you should know the reason is in large part because the Senate Democrats refuse to let you come back to work. Because we could agree for significant portions of the federal government to come back to work Monday morning if simply the Democrats would stop objecting, stop insisting that they get everything on Obamacare. And let me note, the issue on Obamacare is very simple. Is there a double standard? President Obama has exempted big business and exempted members of Congress. And yet, he has forced a government shutdown to deny that same exemption to hardworking Americans. Millions of Americans who are losing their jobs, being forced into part-time work, facing skyrocketing health insurance premiums, and losing their health insurance. Let me remind this body of the words of James Hoffa, the president of the Teamsters, who said that Obamacare is destroying the health care, and he used the word destroying, destroying the health care of millions of working men and women in this country. If, if you don't believe me, perhaps James Hoffa, who put it in writing that it is right now destroying the health care of millions of working men and women, will, will underscore what this fight is about. All the seniors, all the people with disabilities, all the people who are right now getting notices that they're losing their health insurance, that's what this fight is about. And at a minimum, we ought to agree on common priorities. We ought to come together today, right now, and fund the VA. We ought to come together today, right now, and fund our reservists and the National Guard. We ought to come together today, right now, and fund our national parks, open our memorials, stop barricading, and sending police officers to prevent World War II veterans from coming to the World War II memorial, and we ought to come together right now to fund the National Institutes of Health because everyone agrees on that.
and the decision to hold those priorities hostage because the Democrats want to force Obamacare on everyone. It's not related to them. It has nothing to do with them. It's all about political leverage. And Mr. President, that's not the way we should be doing our jobs. We should be listening to the people. We should make D.C. listen. Thank you, Mr. President.